American Hammers Radio presents Fortunes Always Hiding. Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Fortunes Always Hiding podcast here on American Hammers TV and radio. I am Zach. I'm your host. I am joined by Chris, who is now back at Erie, Pennsylvania. And I was expecting more of an Erie scenery from <laughs> you being in Erie. No, no, no. no. Wow. And Johnny, who's, of course, from Philly. What's up? And I was not expecting the, the original four tribes of Ireland flag, but I'm seeing one. So that works for me. Yeah. And you, uh, if you guys ever watch me on uh, American Hammers TV, you can usually see about one corner of it. And I'm sure that's monster. So. All right. So we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. And yeah. this, is going, this is probably going to go way too long. But and to the point where you're probably going to go, you've got to be kidding me. We're, we're really going to go through this way too hard? Yes, we are. All right. So let's talk about South um, Sheffield United. It was, what, our first trip back since t- uh, 2007-ish? Since Tevez. Yeah, since Carlos Tevez played for us. How long ago was that? A long time ago. I wasn't even a fan of the club at the time. I wasn't even paying attention to soccer at the time. Yeah, that yeah, was my first here. season being a West Ham fan, guys. <laughs> What's that? That was my first season being a West Ham United fan. Oh, there you go. It was amazing. Like, I can imagine. I, and, and, you know, to, to, be a, to be in that and to be a part of that and to be watching this and to see our great escape and then to have the downfall of Sheffield United and to see the backlash and to see Sean Bean marching with a bunch of, you know, Terrible looking, atrocious Sheffield United fans through London. Um, <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing. <laughs> two, two Sheffield United supporters are going to listen to this and be like, I hate that guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they're going <laughs> to, I'm not going to say what they're going to do, but it's just, that's just hilarious to me. They're going to they're march. I hate that podcast. <laughs> I would openly enjoy that. <laughs> if that does happen, please send picks. Um, so one of the first things I want to talk about is when they were going. So when they they came to the game from a car auction, which I don't know if you watched that at all, but Steve McQueen's car uh, Mustang got auctioned for oh, a lot of money yeah, on NBC Sports. I was like, I was confused what you were talking about. Yeah, huh. there was yeah. Yeah, it was a whole like six hour long show of just car auctions. And then just just and then to hear the announcers and now Sheffield United versus West Ham. Yeah, <laughs> it was just like what? Off a piece of paper. It was the funniest. <laughs> thing. It kind of reminds me of when the Super Bowl um, blackout and the um, SNL parody. Um, come, don't forget on Monday we got two Brook girls. <laughs> uh. But it just, it was just like one of those most awkward transitions I've ever felt in my life. I was expecting a little bit of a But when they were not, when they were going to the bottom of the team sheet, uh, they said West Ham was playing a four four one one. However, my app <coughs> Soccer twenty four had West Ham as a three four two one. What did you guys see? Did you guys see a four four one one? Did you see a three four two one? Three four two one doesn't even sound like a real thing, you know. <laughs> it sounds like you're playing. It sounds like you're playing FIFA, and you have no idea how to defend against your friends. So you just create that. You just get screw it. I'm going with it. Yeah, um, I'll jump in. Uh, you know what? To me, I thought it was a four four one one. Um, the commentators were absolutely convinced that it was a three four two one. Uh, basically, what that means is two two uh, full two wing backs and two defensive midfielders, right? Um, <clears throat> I, I saw it much more that we were playing with Cresswell as a left back because he got up the pitch a lot. So if you you know if you, if you look back at it, um, Cresswell was very much in an advanced position, but then he would collapse back. But the the, the key to me in, in in really deciding that it was a four four one one was that there were only two defenders who sat back regularly. And they would pass the ball back and forth and distribute it, and that looks more like a flat back or a flat back four to me with with advanced fullbacks. So, but to be honest, there was some fluidity. Cresswell did come back and help out in defense on a regular basis, and sometimes he would play this almost. Um, he would play this position uh, between the midfielders 
uh, but but he would play in like he wouldn't be hugging the touch line, right? He'd be much further in in, in the middle of the pitch. So um, I can understand why there was some confusion to that, but I also kind of think that that's what people assumed when they saw the lineup, especially. And I think Mezwaku is what really uh, tipped people over. They were like, "Wait a minute, he only plays wing back. He can't be a winger." But you. And I know, and I mean Zach and Chris and Johnny all know that Mazwaku is a much better winger than right. fullback. So, uh, yeah, I can't go. I, I can't argue too much with that. I, my my logic or my thinking was with it. It was uh, supposed to play more like a three in the back, but if they needed to, they could shift around almost with Zabaleta coming down into a right back, uh, Mazwaku uh, pushing further up the pitch, and Cresswell slotting in it left back. So that way it on a if they needed to do that on a dime, they could kind of shift the formation. But it didn't it, it just didn't it seemed constantly like fluid. Like they didn't it didn't stick too much for me. I mean it just I, for me it seemed like it created a lot of confusion. Well to to me the the whole game screamed that we need better defense and I said, we're not, it's not even being talked about in the paper. So we're looking at defenders. We're looking at midfielders. Why do we need midfielders? We're loaded in midfield. We don't need another freaking midfielder. We need defenders. We need guys who can stand behind and take the brunt of the shot. And we don't have that. We need guys that can, you should run it down the wing, can be, be with you step for step, even maybe ahead of a step and maybe steal the ball away. That would be lovely. But nope, instead we're getting, we're falling behind and we're, Causing all sorts of problems from behind, but that's gonna we're gonna get into that in a minute. All right. So one of the biggest takeaways from the entire game, despite the fact that we lost, was Fabianski's injury. Mm-hmm. He goes down again in the or very early on, and he's clutching the hamstring. Uh, do we have any news at all? Yes, actually, that came out today. Um, he, it, all it is is apparently inflammation around the area where the surgery occurred. There was no re-aggravation of it. There was no tear of it. And he's only scheduled to miss two weeks. Oh, two weeks. That's a lot better than what I, what yeah. I, 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 I saw. thought that if he re-aggravated it or re-tore it, done for the season. Yeah, but, but you know what this means, right? It means that David Sullivan went, oh, good, I don't have to buy a goalkeeper. <laughs> Well, we'll get into that, but I mean, we still need a goalkeeper. We still need a backup goalkeeper. Martinez, no, no, guys. What we need is someone to challenge Fabianski. Yeah. We need someone who's going to go. I'm younger. I'm hungry. I want to be playing. I should be starting, and therefore, I should be trying to take Fab's place instead of someone who's already injured. And we're way, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's just a lot to rant about, wonderful listeners. When you are a West Ham United supporter, yeah, wait for the news section. It's, it's going to be a good one. Where's Adrian? Honestly, where's Adrian? Adrian, why can't we go back? Go to Liverpool and say, hey, um, he's, he's been a good backup keeper for them. Yeah, gonna, that's the, the problem. He's overperform. He's overperforming. If there was a war statistic like there is in baseball in this sport. He, his war would be through the frickin' roof. Well, he's going to win a title. I don't feel bad for him. <laughs> yeah. He's probably making a pretty penny as well. So I can't, def- I can't defend that. Like, I, I, still, I still think it was a mistake letting him go in the summer. All right, but my biggest question is, because this is, this is the second injury he's had for the same sort of way, why can't a defender take the goal kick? Honestly. After that injury, or after Fabianski went off, Every time David Martin, who's already had a similar injury, took a goal kick, I was cringing. I was just crossing my fingers, hoping that it didn't happen again. I don't, I think that we should start making defenders take the kick. Because if these keepers are getting injured so often on something as routine as that, you need to change something to yes. get them out. Guys, if, if there's, there are some things that show you uh, an issue, and they're not the disease itself. They're the symptom of a disease. This is a symptom of a disease, right? So this is a symptom of a few things. Number one, and I've, I've brought this up before on this podcast. Number one, the, the what are they doing in training? Uh, what, what what are the physios doing with them? Why do we have two goalkeepers getting routine muscle injuries from, from, from kicking the ball back into play? Um, and then two, why is David Martin playing right now when he was signed as the third-choice training goalkeeper? 
uh, and it's all because of a bad uh, physio room and also a terrible transfer policy. And so we are now paying for that. And not only that, but David Moyes, excuse me, not David Moyes, David Sullivan is not in a position where he's going to step up. We should already have had a new keeper in place right now. It's the 13th. We should have already had another keeper. I'm going to go into this. a lot, okay? Yeah. This is going to be a very ranty episode, so just well, prepare. So I, I don't think it's a bad physio room. I think it's the fact that we don't understand. So, like, if you look at Yermolenko, when Yermolenko went down, everyone was just like, ooh. But when he came back, he showed me that he had – he wanted to be still be a part of the team. The physio spent a lot of time with him to get him back to where he was. And now he's – well, he was at least in the first half of the season – a top class um, midfielder, and the fact that we're looking to get rid of him is shocking to me. I would rather have him on than Lanzini right now. Oh yeah, I mean he carried us the first six matches of this season. Yeah, Lanzini's done not not much. I don't know what's going on there. I don't. I mean, Moyes worked with Lanzini before. Uh, maybe Fornals is tired. Maybe like I know there's a sickness going around. Mm-hmm. The squad. Uh, maybe maybe Fornals had a bit of a bug and didn't want to risk it. I don't know what's going on. Maybe he doesn't think Fornals can play that like um, that with that like kind of withdrawn uh, advanced midfielder role. And he thinks he should be on the wing with his energy. I don't know, but I, I think a lot of people thought that there was a mistake to start Lanzini, and Lanzini didn't really show anything to to. He had one good shot, and it was safe. And it was that well, and he should have passed it. And then a lot of people were yeah, like, doing a free kick, but yes, he absolutely one hundred. No, you're right. The free kick was good, but but that one, you know, I I was screaming, pass the ball, pass the ball. Yeah. And, um, you know, and some of the people on the forum on on these up, Mother Brown, were saying, oh, you know, it's actually Alaire's fault. He didn't make a run, and then no. and then that that no. freeze frame uh, when Lanzini gets the ball and Alaire's behind him slightly. So that he could have just squared it instantly. Yeah, but not that free frame came out and everyone went, yeah, never mind. He should have passed it. So for me, I think with regards to both the shot instead of the pass and decision to play Lanzini, I think, I think uh, my personal opinion is Moyes was under the impression that Pablo Fornals is flying right now. His confidence is through the roof. Lanzini is not give him like he wanted. I think he wanted to give him some game time, try and get him to get his confidence built up, get his game back about him. And I think that's also what the shot was. I you see like the Felipe Anderson, the Pablo yeah. Ferrari, how we're saying that he needed that they needed that goal to really kick on and build up their confidence. I think that was Lanzini's way of saying I need this for myself. And when he didn't get it, I think I he's done. I, I don't see him really playing too much more as a player. We needed what we needed to do was was win the match. And, yeah. Yeah. and to be fair, Lanzini was not the only person that should have scored and did not. Um, we had several opportunities, well, a few opportunities really to go. Two chances by. Um, you know, and and Allaire, you know, had some moments as well. Um, I don't think he was nearly as supported this match as he was previous matches, but. Um, you know, I, we should have we should have uh, we should have done better, uh, and now we can get to what in the world was that goal they scored, right? I, 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 well, that brings me to my, my next point. What the hell was Belbuena doing? That was a bad. That was a very bad goal kick. And then Belbuena was doing looked like he just pulled up and was just like, yeah, whatever. It's a two on two on zero. Oh. I'm not. I can't make up. I'm not going to try. And to me, to me, that looks bad. That looks really bad. The fact that you're not going to be able to, you're not even trying to stop a potential goal. Because there's a cro- there was a cross. He could have put his foot out and tried to stop it. And maybe Martin would have got on a piece of it and stopped it. But instead, it ends up in the back of the net off Martin, and we're down one nothing. Second. Yeah. See, for me, I, I I know there was a lot of debate on Twitter whether over whose fault the goal was. Everyone's fault. Who's that? It's everybody's fault. Yeah. I, I think ultimately the response or, or the uh, like the fault lays at Martin's feet because ultimately he's the one passing the ball. He's got to make sure that the guy is looking at him. He's well aware of what is coming. Yes, Bob Winger should have done better, but David Martin should have played a better ball to a guy who was paying attention to where it is. 
How do you pl- how do, if Arbana was looking at him and ready to receive the pass, should have passed it to him so that way he could have been in a better position. But I think so. Ultimately, I think it's Martin's fault. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I mean, and, and, and as much as I love David Martin, I've said it before. You know, he, he shouldn't be in that position in the first place. Um, he's done. He's done well enough. Um, he's not. You know, he's not Ederson. He's not going to pass it out from the back with with you know, grace and poise. Um, sure, there was some confusion, and I know Balbuena could have been in a much better position. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is. It's a straightforward pass. Balbuena, yeah, he made some movement off, like to to get. Basically, though, if you look, he made some movement away from a uh, defensive forward who was rushing at him, and instead, uh, Martin passes it kind of where he was, and so Balbuena has to kind of you know. And Balbuena is a lot of things. He's a very solid defender. He's not super agile, and he's not like yeah. great, like turning, and, and and he's not super quick. So. He's not the person you want. Like Diop could have could have got to that ball, I think. You know, uh, and that's another question. Or on, even on Bonna, I think could have gotten right. the ball. We, we, we I, talk I, about I, Diop in a second, but like I really think that that Martin, number one, Martin should never have passed the ball like that. Yeah. But also, this needs to be talked about. Martin could have saved that, guys. He, he almost did. Under it. I mean, like he absolutely could have saved that. Um, and, and you got to think a, a, a normal Premier League starting goalkeeper is going to save that tame, straight at him shot every time. And I say that with all the love in the world for David Martin and his wonderful family who are dying the wool, dying the wool West Ham supporters. But that was painful. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to go into the Allaire goal, the one that was called off. It was called off because his upper body was offside, so his lower part of the body was onside, which I find hilarious and. But the goal, the goal, the free kick was just absolutely beautiful. It was right on target, and then Alaris' foot was right there. I've been, I was screaming at this in the um, American Hammers Radio podcast, the, the one that I used to do with Tex, um, that this is what we expect, we should expect from Alaris. And Alaris finally did it, and then it gets called back all, immediately. And Alaris knew it immediately too, which is the set, which was the sad part. But it was just beautiful to watch, and I was. I was screaming. I was like, yes, finally. And then, oh, are you kidding me? Smalls, you're killing me. So with, with that one, I, 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 I re- when Snodgrass originally came on, I was not impressed by the change. But he immediately, almost immediately made an impact. He put three perfect balls onto a layer. Yep. The first two were called offside. So the third, he had a perfect shot. He was on – he was on side. He had a perfect chance to just get his head to the ball, and it would have been it would have been a sitter. But and and that's kind of where I have like my issue with both the offsides rule and how it need like I'm I know we'll talk about that later, but like stuff like that, like you said, his upper body is ahead. Um, I was I, I hosted the uh, like uh, after match live stream, like immediate after match thoughts at, with Irish Tommy and I, and he uh, he brought up his idea of changing the rule to being where if you are in line, if any part of you is in line with the defender, then you are on side. And so I think that that in, in a situation like that, that would be very beneficial for West Ham, but also like for everyone else, obviously. But what, at the all, end of the day, I I kind of chalk those up to all there. Like, well, so I have a problem with that, and I'm going to get into that a lot more about about the uh, handball rule because these rules um, suck. These, <laughs> they are not well made. They are not well kept. They are very poorly worded, and we'll talk about that a lot more yeah. coming up soon. But I want to get it. I want to. So I want to talk about the rest of the second half, the ones that the. Moments that didn't count. It seemed like we were going back and forth, back and forth with the ball, like for a lot of that second half. And we just seemed like we were being run ragged. And it just didn't seem to match up anything, really. And like it showed me that we're not what Pellegrini did, did not, he did not bring in a level of fitness that I expected him to. And no. we were just slow. I felt like I was watching a March Madness game to be quite honest when they're going, 
back and forth, back and forth with the miss with the miss shots. I love that in March Madness. I do. That I live for that those moments in March Madness. But in a Premier League game, I don't live for that. I want to see balls in the back of the net. I want to see legitimate offensive scoring chances, not going back and forth and seeing guys being run ragged. Come on. We need well, to do something I mean, like to be to be fair, the Premier League is that kind of league. I mean it's the most physical league uh, in Europe. It demands a level of physical um, prowess and conditioning that you know you don't find in Spain, you don't find in Italy, um, and you know that's part of the reason that like Fornals, for example, has taken you know a, a long time to bat in, and now now he's he's adapted, he's doing well. Um, but I, I didn't really think that was our. I mean, yeah, it's going to take us a while to uh, get to the level of conditioning that that I know Moyes wants, but. Um, if you, I mean, I'm surprised that you were you were surprised about Pellegrini in that regard because if you looked at the statistics, we were down at the bottom of the league in 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 miles ran uh, per match, and um, the same thing happened when Moyes came last time <laughs> when we had Billich, and we were like I think dead last in, in in like how much we ran, and the first thing Moyes said I'm going to get him running more, and just that in and of itself more effort, right? More, more conditioning uh, and, and able to last. I mean, we definitely tailed off at the end, and yes. you know, and, 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 and so, but especially like Mark Noble, he just does not have the legs to be able to to do that um, every match anymore. I mean, Declan was blowing out of his ass uh, at the end, and even 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 when he made that lung busting run where he where we scored and it should have stood, um, but you know, at the end of the match, he was shattered. So, uh, you know. It, we 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 are running more, um, but teams like Sheffield United, man, they've got a style of play. Oh, who said that before? Uh, <laughs> you did. Take a drink. They've got a uh, – I believe I will. Um, they've got a style of play they, that they've been doing now for a long time under Chris Wilder, and he's done an amazing job with them. And somebody on these up Mother Brown was like, well, they have a better squad than us. And I said, no, they don't. What they do is they know what they're supposed to do. They've been doing it for years, and they've bought players who can do that. We are the exact opposite. We've got a lot of talented footballers who do not play the same system in and out. We change managers every 18 months, and we never know what we're supposed to be doing. See, I kind of, we're constantly adapting. I kind of feel like we're at a thrift store, and we see a puzzle. Ooh, it's a thousand-piece puzzle. And then we buy it, and then we bring it home, and we realize – that the pieces from the 1,000-piece puzzle is really just a bunch of pieces amalgamated into one box from a bunch of different puzzles that don't make sense. And you get part of a puzzle here, part of a puzzle there, some random pieces that don't make anything, and he's like, okay, we're done. My, my boss, uh, I'm, I'm in insurance, uh, which is as sexy as supporting West Ham United. <laughs> no, 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 it's less. It's less. It's Trust me, it's less. Um, yes, it is. My boss, my boss has this great saying where he calls it shiny object syndrome, which, <laughs> you know, uh, which, you know, so you're like a barracuda, right? Uh, you know, you, we're going through the water and we're just minding our own business. Then we're just like, what is that shiny? I mean, you can't help it. We just go for it. Right. Like, we need a striker. Um, you know, and, uh, we, and we end up getting somebody and, um, and especially, Oh, there's South American striker, David Sullivan. Ooh, he gets all excited. He's going to make a magazine about him. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Good. So, 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 hang on. To quote a poo, Nahasa peed my pedlon. I'm sorry? Like, Come again? A poo from The Simpsons? The, oh. the Ricky Mart? That's his last name, Nahasa peed my pedlon. I had no clue on that. Yeah, 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 try, yeah try spelling that. I don't know what just happened. Whoever listens to this podcast, you need to start, whenever I say style of play, whenever there's a Simpsons reference, like we can get a serious fortunes always hiding drinking game going. Okay, someone I'm with, uh, drinking with uh, Tim and Tompkins. Tim's drinking anyway. Yeah, that's true. Um, but so going back to like, oh, hang on, so hang on, really? So uh, Apu says eleven thirty. That's the hour where high teenagers come and buy shiny things, and then they cut to um, Jimbo Jones, and he's pulling out aluminum foil. It's like, whoa! It's like looking in a mirror, man. I've never been high. That's just funny to me. I've never done drugs, so. But um, so immediately after, uh, Irish Tommy and I were actually having a conversation about this, this very ex- or this exact thing. About and drugs? He, what's that? About drugs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, about the transfer policy and how yeah, yeah. Uh, everything like that. 
and he made a very good point that we don't bring in people that can fit in slot into our system. Cause we, like you say, we don't have one for me. I think the reason that we bring in, we brought in in recent years, the Andersons in our layers, not necessarily because the manager wants them or because they fit a certain style of play that we adhere to, but it's more for almost like, uh, what was the term? Like, Publicity and advertisement, getting asses in the seats. So, so, so let me address that real quick because I do want to say, generally, you are correct. The only time you're not correct is the is the last eighteen months because we had uh, Husios and we had someone who wanted to have a style of play. The problem was they got the flair players because that's who David Moore, I mean, that's who David Sullivan will pay for, right? But then when they were like, we need this uh, great midfielder, uh, central midfielder, we need this defender, it was just like, well, I mean, I'll do one in Diop because he may have good sell on value. But I mean, like, after that, no. And it's like, well, we need this, we need this fullback. And it's like, we don't, we don't spend money on fullbacks. Come on. <laughs> But like at least we had a, there was a philosophy in, in in play there was a system, it's just that we were terrible at the actual actual execution of it and his methods were outdated. So you know if he was ten, ten even ten years younger, I feel like you know we we might have had a shot with him. And now the problem is that we've got our ownership is going to be like oh look we tried that it doesn't work now we're going to go back to what we know and only work with the agents we like. Well, yeah, well and only working with the agents you like did. The- only gives you a certain amount of players. Like, look at baseball. Look at Scott Boris. Scott Boris is one of the premier agents in American sports. And he does a lot of high-top, quali- high like, top-ranked people. He does Steven Strasburg. He does Garrett Cole, two of the highest-paid baseball players in the history of the game. And I, no one likes Scott Boris. Every general manager and every team owner hates him to no ends. If they get a chance to put him on – like, put him – like, in – um. In history of the world part one, the poor, I love the poor. Oh, psh, they would put, they would shoot the, they would shoot the shotgun at him. They would treat him like a clay pigeon if they could. But because he's so, so damn good, everyone keeps going back to him and everyone loves him. Uh, all the players do. And I, love it. I love it when you start speaking American and I can't, I don't know what he's talking about. There's some, there are Americans who listen to this who are like, yeah, finally he makes some sort of a reference I get, you know, and, <laughs> And I'm sitting here going, what is he? Who? What? How, how have you never seen so, History of the World Part 1? So this is something that um, I, I've mentioned before, too. Uh, I have a lot of friends who don't watch this sport at all. Shocked. Yeah. And it is so difficult trying to explain, like, what we go through. I've had to try and come up with... Uh, like, like almost in layman's terms about West Ham, and there's one thing that I keep circling back to me personally. The fact that we need a drink? Well, yes, but <laughs> we are the Cleveland Browns of England. I knew you were going to say that, man. Especially- no, we're not. Hang on, stop. We're not the Cleveland Browns. No, we're the Washington not. Redskins. We're the Washington Redskins. Oh, dude, no, don't put that on us. Hang on, the Cleveland Browns have not won anything since the 1940s. The Washington Redskins have won things since the 1940s. Okay, look, guys. I'm, I'm not talking about in terms of like that. I know we're going into NFL, and I know Tim doesn't. We, it, we, we need to come. We need to come back yeah, but, really quickly. This season for the Browns, they had the one of the most talented rosters across the board, and went six and ten. Okay. I see what you're getting at, and we. The amount of money that we have spent in the last 18 months or 18 months and the players that we currently have and the manager that we had, it just, I've always come back to, oh, it feels like we are the Browns. I see, because I live in DC, it's more like the Redskins were winning in the offseason, signing key marquee free agents like Albert Hainsworth can't pass his physical. (laughs) <laughs> Aaron Randolph won't take won't take the beep test. Fails the beep test. Gets cut. Gets signed to the Patriots. The simple fact of the matter is that no American sport can really show what we are because there's no relegation system, right? Uh, and and most of them are too young, right? I mean, like, so we've been around. West Ham have been around since what is it, 1895? Yes. So, um, you know, it, it's hard to find like a pure. Uh, you know, cause I've had people ask the same thing. What are they like in American sports? And I'm like, ah, dude, I don't know. Because the NFL is a terrible way 
to look at it. Uh, so, so some of my friends, I was like, remember when the Red Sox couldn't win anything? It's like that. But I only said that because he's a Red Sox fan, and I did convince him to support West Ham, and he never will forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, and on that note, let's, we, we got to talk about the Snodgrass goal and what is a handball versus what is not a handball. Because so my brother's in law school, if you, if you don't know. Uh, he's, down, he's in law school at the University of Miami, uh, in, the one in Florida, not – not the one in Ohio. It's the one in Ohio. Okay. Nautical law. No. Well, and so his biggest complaint ever since he started to read for law school and whatever has been the way that he looks at the English language is completely warped and changed. And so I called him on this literally before getting on this podcast going, I read in the rule and it's like, this is extremely vague and this needs to, this needs to be changed because it's wrong. It, the way that it's written right now, it's wrong. First off, the goal should have counted. We're all in agreement on that, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in case you didn't see the match, what happened was there was a uh, loose ball um, mm-hmm. and between Declan Rice and somebody from Sheffield, don't remember the guy's name, guy from Sheffield heads the ball into Declan Rice's arm and it hits off his arm. Rice gets the ball. He runs up to the box, passes it to Sondergrass, who's on the uh, who's um, on his right. Gets it to Sondergrass. Sondergrass shoots, scores. Some back of the net. It's ninety plus sec two. Everyone's freaking out. It's right in front of the West Ham end. The West Ham supporters are going ballistic. They're jumping onto the pitch. Security has to run out and try to get them to stop doing that. And. It's a magical moment. I get, I'm in my workspace. I'm taking photos. I get up. I start screaming and jump around like I'm a mad idiot. And then they look at VAR for a possible handball. And then I see the replay that it goes off. It goes off a defender's head and onto Rice's arm. How is that a handball? How can you tell me, how can you sit there and tell me that that is a handball? And then you have Rebecca Lowe tell me this is not VAR. This is the new rule. No, this is a VAR problem. VAR should not be looking at this. This should be a clear Goal. This, the rule that, as it's written, promotes cheating, and that is cheating. This sh- this should be looked at no different than the way the Houston Astros. Je- what happened to the Houston Astros? What happened to them? The manager got fired. The GM got fired. They got fine draft. They got they got doc draft picks. They. I was actually talking about oh. that on the podcast. But it it's absolutely mind boggling the fact that something like this is allowed to happen. And I I found a goal dot com article about this. Um, and it said, hang on, the ball, there, there will be no penalty if the ball touches a player's hand slash arm immediately from their own head slash body slash foot or the head slash body foot of another player. And that, t- is that clear to anyone? Show of hands. Is that clear to anybody? Honestly, I got to be honest. That's clear to me because it means that Declan did nothing wrong. Because it said, yeah. if... If someone heads the ball against the body part, right? So against the arm, it's not even his hand, right? So I, I know why. So I actually, I disagree with you. I think it is the rule. I think the rule is vague. The rule, but but like they've been, they've been, taught, they've been, taught, they've been taught to clamp down on it this year. Any handball that leads to a goal, they're going to call back. They said at the beginning of the year, they're trying to they're trying to show that they, they they're serious about this, but. What I thought was really interesting is, did you guys see the, what people were posting where Virgil van Dyke trapped the ball? It comes yeah, out oh, you know, all the way up here. He, he basically dribbles, basketball dribbles it back down and then passes it and they score? Yeah. Was that called off? No. No. But Declan, from six centimeters away, someone heads it against his arm, bounces, and then bounces back down to the pitch. Then he continues to run, then pass it, then somebody else shoots, but that gets called off. I want to add something too because I saw this uh, video uh, on Twitter. Someone had posted because and they, and they raised a very good point on it. After the ball he- comes off of Rice's arm, it actually comes back down off of the knee of the defender. With that, technically, that constitutes as a diff- new phase of play. Yeah. Okay. So it, it should even with this rule in place, it should have stood. So let's let let let's let's go ahead and address this though. This is a West Ham United podcast. Most opposition fans, if they listen to this, number one, they're going to go, "What happened? Why did I click on this?" Number two, they're going to say, <laughs> "They're going to say, look, um, 
I think these guys are whining because they lost. They're West Ham fans. They're biased. Whatever. No, the rules are very vague. Every single, every single ex pro on Twitter, like even Jamie Carragher, who no one even likes unless you like love Liverpool and like pray to the altar of Anfield every single night. (laughs) Every single ex pro was like, "That's ridiculous." That's not a handball. The game is dead. Like people were like Michael Owen. He only talks about like what horse he's betting on. (laughs) Michael Owen was like, are you kidding me? This is not a handball. And so every single ex pro, no matter where they played, were outraged about this and supported Declan. The only reason you did not support this is if you're still mad that we relegated you in 2007 and you deserved it. So cool. two th- two things I want to bring up real quick. First of all, I got to give props to Declan for that post match interview. Yes, that where he just ripped VAR a new one. He said what every single current player wants yeah. to say but couldn't. Well, and you saw that he got fined, right? Oh no, he didn't because he was hey, telling the truth. Hang on, how much did he get fined? No, I, I joked and I said no, I was joking because I, I, no, no, he did not because he was telling the truth and no one said anything about it. What was? What was In it? America, he would be fined the maximum allowed under the CBA. Well, so, no, listen, guys, he's disputing a rule in a press conference. They absolutely can find him. And yeah, the, silence, the silence from the FA about this has been deafening. Well, it, to me, it's, it says a lot. It says that, th- that they were wrong and they should come out and apologize and they should force a point split. Right. And I also want to. I also hey, wanna, hey, if the FA has the ability to do that. They I don't think I did. But they won't. They never going to fault. They're never going to admit fault. Well, hang, well, hang on. To be quite honest, other sports leagues have. I've seen the NHL do it. I've seen the NFL do it. The NFL did that uh, with the um, Saints Rams in the last NFC Championship game. They apologized. Did nothing about it. They should have been. Re- the game should have been replayed. The Premier League yeah. never goes against its own refs. Well. No. And but, that that needs to change. That need, that honest to God needs to change, and that needs to change in America too. That needs because we we have America has some of the worst refs in this sport ever, and I've seen piss poor calls. I've seen games called thirty seconds before the end of time, and I've seen Gio Severese when he was an Air Cosmos manager run out and start screaming, rip off his sweater, and start screaming like and go out like he was Bruce Banner and the Hulk, and just be really really mad. And I'm like, yes, Gio. Fuck pro refs. Fuck pro refs. Fuck pro refs. And we were all chanting from the sidelines, screaming that. And what happened? He got fined. Big deal. But it shows to me that this needs to change. And we're not. We and there's a lack of organizational control between the FA and the FA at the FA refs. And there's no communication going back and forth saying what's going on. And that's a problem to me. No, there is communication, but it's- and the communication's wrong. No, dude, we think we have an old boys network over here. They have lords, dude. They have, they have, <laughs> people, they have people, they have an old boys network that goes back to 800 AD, right? Hey, so, are, they all, hang on, are they all wearing white powdered wigs? Uh, only at home. But um, <laughs> hey, you, I mean, like, the FA, are, they don't want anything to change. They want everything to be kosher, and all they care about is the Premier League making money. You can so, ask anyone in the lower leagues, any anyone in England who supports a lower league club, ask them what the FA's done for them. Nothing. I, so, hey, Chris, go ahead. I want to say one thing. Part of my language for this, I'm not I haven't really done this before, but I want to give a big fuck you <sighs> to the Sheffield goalkeeper for <laughs> his Twitter post afterward. The no. VAR thumbs up. You didn't deserve that shit. You were a piece of crap. F out of here. <laughs> he had to save of the he had to save of the game. Still though, I mean it, No, I was stupid. But and Declan called it out. He said we're celebrating VAR. We're celebrating non goals like they're goals. He's like, yeah. what's what's going on? Well, so I need to find out who those lords are. Because, <laughs> well, so show of hands, who's who has anyone seen Lincoln? Which, no. The movie the movie about the Civil War? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Who's so, Lincoln? <laughs> You're funny. That's a joke. Lincoln, Illinois. No, so there's a line in the movie. There's a line in the movie where Abraham Lincoln's going on about some guy who goes to visit friends in, in the UK, and there's a picture of George Washington in the bathroom, and he goes to the bathroom. And he comes back at the table, and there's dead silence. Like, so how was your trip? Oh, it was fine. What do you think of the picture of George Washington? 
Oh, it's appropriate. Why so? Because nothing makes an Englishman shit faster than the sight of George Washington. I am yeah, true. There is two things I've kept from that movie. That is number one. <laughs> but if you've not seen it, it's a really good movie. Watch it. I, it's Very really good movie. Good. Yes. We agree on that. No, See, no, we no, agree on that. No, what? Now I want to go back and rewatch it. <laughs> we can do that after the podcast. But I think we're all in agreement that the rule is stupid and the rule needs to be changed. But one of the things that we, I want to talk about when doing research for this is to talk about build up. So, Chris, you said when it hit off the defender's knee, is that a, a new build up or what? That, that's what everyone was saying, that it constitutes a new phase of play. Because now then it's off of the defender and Rice picks it up. Well, so because it brings up a lot of questions. So let's say it didn't hit the knee. Let's say, let's say the goal it didn't happen and the goalkeeper saves it. And it goes back out to – and Cresswell gets the rebound. He passes it back up to, I don't know, Noble, and Noble settles it down. And then Noble sends it in and it finds, I don't know, a liar. And a liar heads it in the back of the net and it's a goal. Would that be called back because it's – part of the same phase of play or is there an imaginary line that it needs to cross or do we need to bring the 35 yard line that the NASL had? I would love that. I would love that. We're we're being too, and I've talked about this a little bit before we're being too legalistic because in this country, the rules matter. The rules have to make sense. They have to be logical. And that's why our sports change the rules every single year. Even even if it makes it worse and, 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 and less complicated. So, for example, what is a catch in the NFL? <laughs> I have no idea. I don't no, 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 we're not, we're not Des did not catch it. It's it's the same yeah. question. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Right. It's just, it's it's like a, it's like a Zen Cohen. So hang on, it's this. That that's not it. You both look like you're doing something inappropriate. But, <laughs> What, no, Bart Simpson responded to that. What I'm really getting at here is that in England, they're trying to make rules so that the, the, that like nothing gets in the way of, of fairness and the flow of play. So ironically, by trying to change the rule, which is what they don't want to do, they have proven themselves right and made it worse because now – Handball is getting in the way of the flow of the game, and VAR is destroying the flow of the game. Yeah. And, you know, so look, 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 we all look, we all need to agree on this. We need VAR. Yeah. We okay. need video replay in certain situations. So, for example, like when um, when Rice had a red card, straight red, and they they looked at it again, it was yellow. That was right. Right. That was, right. That was, yeah. that was a good call because when when he when he tackled that first time, he got all ball, and then the follow through knocked the dude down. Yes, it was from it was from behind. It was fast, but that's football, right? In the nineteen seventies, people would have been like, "That's the most brilliant tackle." But anyway, so like now, what they what they've done is they by trying to define this in, in a more particular way and then clamp down on handball. What they've done is they've made it prohibitive for us to really um, like uh, address the issue of ball hitting the hand. And, and they've made it to where it interferes with goal scoring opportunities, which hurts the brand. And I feel like that's why what's going to happen after this season, because they won't do anything. They won't admit fault. They're going to sit on their hands and be quiet, good little boys who went to private school. Mm. And they're going to get to the end of this season. And then they're going to go, well, actually, we've decided based on philosophical reasons to change the rule to this. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> And I, I actually see that statement, like, for phil- philosophical reasons. Yeah, no, n- not because we were wrong, but just because, uh, because of this. We felt like it. Yeah. And that, to me, that's a huge problem. And it needs to be addressed. It's, we cannot have this old boys club anymore. It's, the tw- it's 2020, people. We need to realize that, that things need to change. And well, I mean, look, did you're right, but it's not going to happen in England. Those guys are going to be in power until they die. I mean, that's what lords are, people. But what we're also going to deal with, I mean, we can't throw stones. Our English, I mean, our American, um, you know, uh, FA, uh, what are they called? U.S. Soccer? USSF. Uh, yeah, whatever. I hate them. Um, yeah, they're, they're run. Like, a stack of chain smoking monkeys can do a better job. It was the yeah, best time to blush to find. A bunch of like corrupt, lazy lords. They're just dudes who were like, how much money are you going to give me if I make kids go into your camp? You know, like, I mean, that's all they are. So so there's a great book called American Huckster. It's written by two New York Daily News journalists. 
I can't believe I'm, I'm promoting the New York Daily News, but I am. Yeah, yeah me too. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be promoting the New York Post. But <laughs> oh god, <laughs> I'll get into that later after the show. But the two, uh, two New York Daily News journalists who wrote about um, the really fat guy um, weighed about 450 pounds, uh, white beard, white hair, um, Santa Claus. <laughs> he looked like Sam, he looked like a living version of Santa Claus, although he couldn't breathe and had an apartment right next door for his cats. Wait, 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 hold on really quickly, Zach. You're yeah. saying Santa isn't real? No, 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 no. He's not saying that. He's not saying that. Anyway, I feel like we got off track. Hang on, hang on. This I'm is the West Ham podcast. How are we talking about Santa Claus right okay, now? Okay, we're talking Richard, Richard Blazer. Richard Blazer. Don't know him. West Ham wanted uh, an American defender. Was it was it Rain? Was it Tim Rain? No, Aaron Long. Aaron Long. Yeah, yeah. from uh, Red Bull, New York Red Bulls. That's right. So, uh, so a little bit of preview. I, I have not heard. I, I break it to you guys right now. There's been no talk of any defenders. We don't need a defender. I completely disagree with Zach on this. We need a midfielder, 100%. We need, we need pace in central midfield. We need pace in central midfield. We, we need a wing back, uh, damn it. We need yeah. a wing. We have, I, I have a midfield from Apple Wazoo. We have a midfield from the U23 team. Right back? What? There has not been right any word on a right back. We need a right back. I agree. But so I'm going to be a little bit of both here. I agree that we need some help in defense. I don't think it's as severe as um, you might say, Zach. But when you say that we are, we don't need a midfielder. Our options right now are like, and realistically, Lanzini, who's not up to it, Mark Noble, whose legs are going. You have Rice, who's obviously top tier, like. Right, who's probably going to get sold off to Barcelona, Real, Bayern. No, 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 we're, we're, depressed enough, we're depressed enough this episode. We don't need to get into that. I've already knocked on wood. But then beyond that, you have Jack Wilshere, who's played eight matches for us uh, in a season and a half, and Carlos Sanchez. Oh, Jesus Christ. Tom, you look, Looking at that lineup of midfielders, you, you can not tell me we – we do not need a midfielder. Uh, the Cleveland Browns are better than us. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. So basically what we're talking about uh, for people that, li- you know, everyone who listens to this podcast watches soccer. I don't know why I'm saying this, but um, we are essentially playing with no offensive line. Yeah. Just go right through the middle. Just go ahead. We got great, great quarterback, great running back. Well, we even have a fullback who blocks – Every once in a while, but like anybody else, just waltz on through and stop. Yep. So, do we want to go ahead and get into the news section because I can bring up some stuff? So, without any further ado, let's get into some news, please, Chris. All right, so <clears throat> I'll brief. I'll, I'll begin this with saying that there has been very little news. There is no news. We just kill people. All it- right. It's from Urin Town. Have you never seen the show? Come on, people. No. <laughs> watch, watch a Broadway show every once in a while, will you? Is there at least a theater in, in You are way in too cultured for this podcast. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, this is my problem. My brother. I, 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 there is a theory, theater in Erie. I have. I want to check it out. I have not yet. So Give let's get this message to it. So the first one I have is uh, actually – was broken by Nico, Nicolo Shura, the same one who broke the Allaire news, that says uh, West Ham want to sign Inter, Malay, Inter Milan ace Roberto, I'm going to butcher this, uh, Gagliardini. How many letters? How many letters? Don't, don't count. Just, just keep going. 11. Uh, but, of course, on loan. But Inter Milan are not – or would only want to sell. He's falling down the pecking order because Inter Milan is in for Arturo Vidal mm. from Barcelona. And more importantly, the player is not convinced about coming. Um, obviously then, moving on from that, <clears throat> if you're on Twitter at all, you've seen all of the 
all of the nightmare scenarios with uh, Fernandez of Benfica, now probably going to Tottenham. <clears throat> because we putzed around, we dragged our feet, only for him to find out that the bigger name club, a bigger name club in London, where his mother resides, is interested in him. So he's like, "All right, bye, West Ham. I don't care if I have friends there or not." And they'll they'll pay him more. Yeah, that too. They're gonna um, give him more. They uh, we 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 lowballed him in wages. Well, and this is a problem that we have with our owners. Lowballed Benfica. Our rumored uh uh like clause at the end of the 18 month loan was only about 36 million euro. Tottenham are in for a 50 to 60 million euro uh, buy clause at the end of that 18 month loan. So Benefica is getting the better end of the deal as well. Is Jeff Bezos in the market for a soccer team? I would love that. <laughs> but than David squared. Right now, um, dude, let's get let's get Elon Musk so we can be sponsored by either Tesla or SpaceX. SpaceX, yes, yes, yes. 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 brought to you by SpaceX. We're cool. launching a we're launching a Western kit into space. We will be the first team ever into space. I All love that, that ridiculous like angular jerseys like that. that oh the- yes, <laughs> yes, I'm all in for that. I am all in for that. I am literally going up and down with my hands in excitement because I cannot jump. I'm now, I say, when we're talking about us blowing the Fernandez deal, um, uh, powers that be at um, American Hammers, we need like a like a like a for the podcast, we need a, a face palm sound or, or yeah. something. You know, like can we can we get that? I need it to be quite honest. I need a soundboard. Oh, yes, God, you do. Yes, we need to plan this right now. <laughs> we need. Uh, a, I need. Oh, a, a, going. We've already we've already been on the air for a minute. So go ahead. <laughs> so. All right, moving on. Darren Randolph is still not at the club. It it seems like he'll never pass a medical. I don't know why we're in for him. We need to pull out of that deal. But on the on the news of goalkeepers, we have apparently made a seven million uh, pound bid for Cardiff City goalkeeper Neil Etheridge. Ooh, that's the first time hearing this. I do not know too much about him. He's wonderful. He's healthy. (laughs) <laughs> well, and that's I hope, I pray. healthy is literally half the battle here <laughs> yes is he welsh i don't know I, i'm just reporting on i haven't done too much research into the player themselves it's just Come on. Uh, i know it's been a slow news week this all came, this is stuff from the last uh, few days born in london oh yeah and then Moving on from that, apparently uh, West Ham are probably going to miss on out on uh, Gabagol. It seems like Flamengo is going to snatch him up. Um, nothing confirmed at the moment, but whatever. Did you read about why? No. Remember, but, we want dun, 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 a loan deal. Of course. He goes, we don't want to buy anyone because you know, that, that's what the logical thing is. We're at West Ham United. We do the illogical thing. And here's the, here's the piece of news that had probably pissed me off the most and will probably piss you guys off too. We have not been – we are halfway through the January transfer window. We have very little links to anyone. We have not brought in anyone. And the one player that we're trying to can't pass a medical. But yet we are open to sending Andre Yarmolenko – out either fully for good or loan, even to Premier League sides. Oh, jeez. This, so this is just piss poor management. And because we don't have a director of football right now, this is showing that we are completely idiotic and have no idea what the hell we're doing. <laughs> so so I, I was lucky enough to sit down with John Nolan and interview – um, the writer of the H list uh, a few weeks ago, uh, amazing, amazing um, uh, time we had, and that's that's on American Hammers TV. If you guys want to watch it on our YouTube channel, but we we talked about this 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 concept of you know maybe the owners are not incompetent, maybe they just want to put as little money as possible 
um, and, and and keep expenditures low so they can sell and make the ma- and maximize their profits well, in so- 2023, right? So, but so like. So I understand, and then like I actually said at the time um, that I really see his point, but at the same time, there do there are moments when the incompetence is so obvious, and I feel like this is one of those moments where, where we're going through, like I can see that they don't want to spend money, but they're blowing their chance, and guys, we could get relegated. Well, okay, so really quickly, I actually just reread uh, the article that I had. Not only are we willing to, we've actually been offering him. Jesus Christ. Uh, he may want to go. He very well may want to go, go but I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but you are in a relegation scrap. In the last few days, I've seen Aston Villa bring in Pepe Reina. Guaranteed he's not the greatest goalkeeper in the world, he's but good. they're doing something. He's good. Uh, he's 37. That's why. That's why I'm like, eh. But um, even today, uh, Norwich brought in, I believe, a midfielder from Hoffen or Hoffenheim. Am I correct in saying? That? Yes, it's Hoffen. It's Hoffenheim. You're correct. Awesome. Um, funny enough, with that one, that actually got that one went a little bit viral because it, they said um, we've sent or like we've agreed to sell whatever his name is, to uh, Premier League basement boys, um, Norwich City. But the fact of the matter is is that two of the relegation – three of the relegation clubs are now. Watford is flying at the moment. They're doing incredibly well. Aston Villa is trying to sign players to get – to bolster themselves. Norwich is signing players. We are offering players – when we're in a scrap, it does not make any sense to so me. To, to me, this tells me that one, the owners at, without a, we don't have a direction. We are literally floating in the sea like a message in a bottle, and <laughs> don't know where we're going to end up. We may end up it going to the coast of Canada, the U.S. We may end up in Portugal or Spain. We don't know. It, but, at the same t- but at the same time, the fact that we're that, – and it shows that this is a rebuilding year for us. And in American sports, you know, a rebuilding year. It's been for the last – since we've left Upton Park. Well, and I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that we really wanted to win for Upton Park. We wanted to make the last year at Upton Park special. And now that we're here, we don't know what the fuck to do. So yeah. – wholeheartedly and, agree on that. But – um. <laughs> One thing I was also I was going to say, Irish Tommy brought this to my attention. I don't know if you guys know this or not. Besides being a lot of our targets being agent fueled, we only have five scouts across the entire continent. That is correct. Wait, what? To have to have, five know. scouts across the entire continent. Yeah, England of Europe and Europe. Okay, yeah. so how many do other teams have? They. Like, so- Irish Tommy said that some clubs have tw- like ten to fifteen in the northern half of the country. Yeah, in the northern half of the country? Are you kidding me? I think Southampton have twenty in England. Yeah, we what what we do? Isn't how dire we are with this board. We, we talk to a few, a handful of agents that David Sullivan likes to work with, and we get recommendations based on that. Of who's available, and then we work through those agents, and then we try to lowball and 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 oh, basically Harry Redknapp. We try to Harry Redknapp it, right? We're gonna oh, we're gonna scan. How about wheel and deal? You know, razzle dazzle. Any real West Ham fan knows what razzle dazzle is, and that's what we're trying to do. And we always razzle, and we forget the dazzle, and it doesn't so, work out. So I sent a text in one of my last podcasts with him that bringing in David Morris. Would bring would bring back the protest and would bring back coins being thrown at them. Which there's a protest scheduled for the 18th, and it is gaining massive traction. Well, yeah. you know, Zach, Zach, I don't, the funny thing is that David Moyes now is not the problem, and we all know it. No one's mad at David Moyes. No, it's the it's the board. It's the board's problem. The board's not doing anything. We're not going out signing new players. We're offering are some of our top players to other teams in the league that yeah. we're going to probably have to face before the end of the year in May. And this really bugs me. We're not playing in Europe. Yermolenko is Ukrainian. 
He could go to Germany. He could go to Italy. He could go back to Ukraine. And no one would bat an eye. No, everyone would be like, bye. Thank you very much for your 18 plus months of service. We appreciated it, uh, but have fun playing in a new country. And we would all be very happy about it. But the fact that to sell him to uh, Premier, another Premier League side is mind boggling to me and just makes me want to take a pillow and throw it out my window because I'm just that pissed off about it. This is stupid. We are being run. We're a pack of chain smoking monkeys. I hate to say it. Could probably do this better than what we're being done. And well, that- I think I think the fans who have no connections and very little experience could probably run better a better operation than than you the know, current board. I've supported West Ham for for an American for a long time. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know there are seventy year old guys in in East London right now who go, oh, are "You kidding me? Shut up!" But for an American. <laughs> West Ham for a while. Not wrong there. Um, this is why when I tell neutral fans who I support, they go, "What? Why in the world would you ever support West Ham?" And I go down my list of you know awesome working class club, you know history, play football the right way. I'm the best fans in the world. Um, well, traditionally, uh, good point. Good point. And you know the highs are great, the lows are lows, but whatever. Um, but like, there are a lot of fans right now who really feel that we're losing every single year. That what made us special, what made us different. Yeah. And um, I got to be honest, this is a low point for me. I mean, well, like, this, this I need, past week has been atrocious. Well, I need to say, it. I, I felt like we've been losing that since about 2008 when the Icelandic guy went bankrupt. Tell me yeah. if I'm wrong here, but ever since he uh, he went bankrupt and we were pretty much SOL, what was there to do? And there wasn't. From what I've been able to read about this, this situation, when the when David Squared came in and bought the team back, there was nothing that we could do other than just be SOL and be fish out of water. Wow. Uh, it, it really kind of right now. It really kind of shows what a fluke season the final season at the Bolton was. Well, and which is very unfortunate because I on I honestly remember that season very well. I remember watching yeah, what and, the season supporting the club. Yeah, and I remember screaming at the end of almost every match in, cel- in celebration, being like, yes, this this is great. This is great. We're going to build on this. And then Payette goes to Euro 2016 as a phenomenal Euro, takes some extra time off, doesn't come back for European qualifiers, and it just was a, was a huge problem. And on that note, I hate to say it, but there's really not, not much more we can talk about without no. going back and doing it. So on that note, for John and Chris, this is Zach signing off. We will talk to you all next Monday, well, next week. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, I'm not confident, but hopefully we can get a win against Everton. Well, I was about to say, we play oh. Everton at 10 oh. on Saturday, and I hope to God we can at least get a, get a point. Yep. Otherwise, we're going to be back here, and we're going to be very, very angry. I, I'm going to say this: if we don't get a win against Everton, or at least a point, I see this podcast being an hour and a half long of us just ranting. <laughs> oh God! I okay. Now no one's going to listen to the next one. But <laughs> guys, um, thanks so much for listening. Yeah, thank thank you very much for listening. Thank you for Tim uh, for believing in us, and thank you for Delay for giving us this platform. It's I love doing this every week. I just, by the way, I just put a American Hammers radio sticker on my car because I do not, I can't, I still can't believe that I'm a part of this. This is fantastic to be a part of. It's a lovely, I, I love every single one of these, everyone, every single one of the people I've met on this. It, it, they're fun to, they're uh, extremely fun to do, but at the same yeah. time, I'm just hoping to God we have so at least another win within the next month. Yeah. At least. Well, I wish I'd support Manchester United. No, no, uh, no. We're worse shit than us. Wait a minute. No. Wait a minute. And on that note, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. This has been an American Hammers radio production on AmericanHammersTV.us. <laughs>